Now, will they succeed? I'll close on this thought, and this is indeed how I close the book as well. It would be nice, and it would make me happy if I could somehow say, sure, they're going to do very, very well, because they're going back to this Islamic tradition. But I actually don't conclude that way, though um, one of the frustrating things, as anyone here in the, in the room uh, who writes knows, is that sometimes when your books get analyzed by other people, they, they don't get to the last page. And so, or the last chapter even, let's say, to be a little less generous. And so if you describe a phenomenon, another phenomenon that we have now today is if you describe something happening in the world, you describe the rise of Islamist political thought, you say that it's the most vibrant movement opposing autocracy in the Muslim world today, which is, I think, objectively true. People think that by virtue of describing it, you must be saying how much you love it. I'm not saying that I love it in the book, nor am I ultimately saying it's going to succeed. Instead, what I say is that these new institutional arrangements of legislatures informed by Islamic values, of Supreme Courts or high courts that are supposed to engage in some kind of Islamic judicial review, are actually very unlikely to deliver successfully the kind of good government that we saw in the classical Islamic world. And the reason is that we're talking about inventing new institutions. And to invent new institutions is the single hardest thing to do in political science, in political theory, in political practice. You can write them up on a piece of paper with no trouble at all, but to make them actually operate and function in the real world requires the commitment of people, it requires time, and most importantly, if you have a strong executive, as you have in Egypt, in Syria, in Jordan, you name it, that executive is going to fight back against allowing institutions check his power, and it's still mostly his. Right? In Iraq, you have the opposite problem. Right? By destroying a centralized authority and failing to replace it with anything else, you don't have any substantial central authority. Right, so you don't, that's, a, that's a different kind of a problem. So it's going to be very hard for these systems actually to deliver the kind of effective government that they promise. What I do think, though, is that people are going to continue to support these movements, regardless of whether they're going to succeed or not, until they get a chance to succeed or to fail. And I think repressing them or making it harder for them to gain power is unlikely to be successful in convincing people not to pursue them. And so if there's a policy punchline, it's that when we in the West or the United States who are engaged with the Muslim world think that what we should be trying to do is somehow stand in the way of the rise of Islamic government motivated by the aspiration to Sharia, we should think long and hard about what it is we're standing in the way of. If we're standing in the way of religious values we don't like, fair enough. I mean, it might be a good or a bad idea, but at least it's comprehensible. But if we're standing in the way of the rule of law, we're putting ourselves on the wrong side of an actually desirable impulse. And I'll just finish with a practical example of this. You know, um, when President Musharraf uh, recently abolished the Constitution, he suspended the Constitution, arrested the Chief Justice of the, of the Supreme Court, um, put under house arrest several other justices, and then arrested many of 50,000 lawyers in the country, most of whom were secularists, and did this on the public justification that he was protecting the country against Islamists, the United States essentially went along with him. I mean, Secretary of State put in a private call to, to Musharraf, the content of which we don't know because it was a private call. But our public position was, OK, suspend the Constitution, suspend the rule of law. What do we care? To my mind, this is an unbelievably short-sighted policy. And in fact, in Pakistan, we were shocked, shocked when just a few months later in the elections, people overwhelmingly voted against Musharraf. Now, we can't be, the United States can't be, and I think should not be, on the wrong side of the rule of law. This is a little different than saying we should be out democratizing. It's a slightly different claim. Um, democratizing has its positive sides, uh, especially when it involves putting pressure on governments to allow elections rather than knocking out those governments completely and hoping that a democratic society will suddenly emerge. But what I'm pointing here primarily to is the idea that the rule of law remains a powerful and popular idea in the Muslim world, and that one of the main sources of support for Islamists, not the only, but one of the important ones, is their aspiration to deliver the rule of law and their claim that in keeping with the Sharia, which is after all a system of law, they can do so.